This is a judgment on how excited people get and how high they're willing to go for things that are unproven. And right now, especially when we talk about the interest rate environment, high interest rate environments historically just basically rein in people's most profligate instincts. And all of a sudden, they go from being like, I will pay anything for this thing that I want right now, to maybe that's not such a good idea. Maybe I should think twice about this. Hi, I'm Andrew Goldstein, and this is The Art Angle, a podcast from Artnet News where the art world meets the real world, bringing each week's biggest story down to earth. Well, it's happened again. I know you can't believe it. We still haven't totally come to terms with it either. But Tim Schneider has gone prophetic again. Yes, that's right. At the beginning of every year, our art business editor gets imbued with the uncanny gift of prophecy, allowing him to peer into the future, the future, specifically and exclusively, of the global art industry. Is it a blessing or is it a curse? I'll let you be the judge. But in any case, as it is tradition here at The Art Angle, it's my humble and odd privilege to have the great seer, known as Tim, back on the show today to talk about what we can expect from the art business this year. So welcome, O oh, Tim the All-Knowing, back onto the show. Thanks for having me, Andrew. So which undervalued artist should I buy and then flip quickly this year? I am probably not the right person to ask for that, but I can tell you about many other things if you're interested. Anything that can help my portfolio would be appreciated after the recording. But anywho, before we get into this year's predictions, why don't we quickly review your auguries from last year? It seems you managed to score 5.5 out of 10 on your 2022 predictions, which to me sounds less all-knowing than semi-knowing, but I'm no expert on soothsaying. So, let's review. What would you say was your biggest bullseye from last year's predictions? Just because it speaks to the overall health of the auction market, which is obviously a big topic, I would say that my biggest hit was predicting that the total value of fine art sold at auction through November of 2022 would be less than for the same period of 2021 after you adjust for inflation. So this is uh, something that I think people might be surprised by. Well, in general, people's perception of how well the auction market is doing isn't necessarily always that close to how it's really doing if you sort of do the types of wonky things that I like to do, meaning, oh, why don't we look at the hammer total instead of the price after you glom on all these fees? Why don't we try to break out how many lots were withdrawn pre-sale and like, count those as past lots instead of saying, oh, well, there were supposed to be 50 lots in the sale, but actually now there are only 45, so let's just do all of our math off of 45 lots. Combine all that kind of stuff with the fact that we know that we had some huge, huge sales last year headlined by the biggest sale of all time, which was the sale of the Paul Allen collection, which made, I believe, $1.6 billion on its own in November. And if you take all that into account, and then I come in and say, hey, by the way, none of that actually did quite as well as the year before, it does sound surprising. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think this sounds kind of uh, similar to what we were picking up at the art fairs last year, which is that the high upper echelon seemed to be pretty secure, but the middle market was actually pretty soft. Well, yes and no. I think that the reality is that the high end of the market was pretty secure, but it wasn't just a blockbuster market the way that we hoped. If you look at the actual individual results of the trophy lots that went to auction last year, and when we say trophy lots, we mean lots that sold for $10 million or more. What you find is that a pretty high proportion of them actually hammered below their estimates or like right at their estimates, or in some cases just got withdrawn completely or passed. And so because it's the very, very high end of the market that really makes up the majority of what the totals are, if those lots start to kind of lose altitude a little bit, it ends up being extremely important in terms of determining how the market as a whole actually ends up doing. And because we had that kind of 
semi sneaky underperformance at the tippy top of the market, it added up over time. And lo and behold, once you factor in inflation, what you find is that the total for this period in 2022 actually fell about a full billion dollars underneath the equivalent total of the previous year. And Hmm. that's a pretty substantial difference. Okay, I'm convinced. So what would you say was your biggest miss from your predictions last year? So ironically, the answer to that is the prediction that I felt the best about at the time, which was that every major art fair in 2022 would still require attendees to wear masks and to present proof of COVID vaccination or a negative test or sufficient antibodies. So that prediction was wrong by June because Art Basel in Basel was the first major fair to basically do away with those types of restrictions. And as anybody who has been out walking around in the global art industry in the time since can tell you, it's largely a free-for-all with the exception of some countries in East Asia. So all in all, pretty far off the mark there. Yeah, I remember Art Basel Paris, especially a totally crowded VIP day that was very much cheek to jowl. Nobody was wearing a mask. That was kind of a wake-up call, I thought. Okay, so let's get into your adumbrations for 2023. What do you predict is going to happen in the art business this year? Hit me with one of your favorite predictions. So let's again start with the big picture side of things. So I am predicting that auction sales of fine art in China and in the UK will both plummet at least 5% year over year from January 1st to December 1st. Okay, so why China and why the UK? Well, the global economy as a whole is just extremely strange right now. If you look at the US, for instance, over the course of the past year, we've ended up with the highest rates of inflation since I believe the Jimmy Carter administration. We have the highest interest rates in 15 years. And we finally got the first honest to God bear market for stocks that we've had since the Great Recession. And yet none of that has really done much of anything to cool off what has been a pretty hot jobs market or to reduce wages. And all of those things together just If you ask a typical economist, they'll just be like, we have no idea what to do with this combination of factors. The thing is, though, if you compare the U.S. to what's happening in China and in the U.K., the U.S. actually looks like it's in somewhat better shape. And the reality here is that China, which has been defined for years by this so-called zero COVID policy, which is basically that... Xi Jinping came out at the very early stage of the pandemic and was like, look, we are shutting this down completely. And anytime there is a positive case anywhere, we are just essentially locking everything down again because we don't want this thing to spread. China did that for years. And then in December, all of a sudden, because of the toll that it was taking on the economy, they reversed it. The problem is that that has created an entirely different type of chaos. Now the economy is hurting because COVID is spreading like wildfire in China, which is screwing up many of the same things just as bad or worse as were being screwed up when basically people were being locked down in their apartment complexes for a long time. Other experts will tell you that the Chinese real estate market, which makes up an outsized portion of Chinese GDP, it's actually in a state where... It's creating what one analyst in the Financial Times referred to as, quote, a slow motion financial crisis, unquote. So things are not great over there, to say the least. Then if you look at the UK, even people who don't really care about the economy know that things have been very bad over there because we just went through this entire period where their prime minister's tenure was being compared in an endurance test to a head of lettuce, and she lost And that was largely because of the chaos that was being unleashed in the economy, some or most of which flows from the kind of what I refer to as the poisonous flowering of the Brexit policy. 
so things are really bad over there. There was a Financial Times survey of economists who focus on the UK, and that came away with the result that a quote-unquote clear majority of the 101 people who responded said that the UK was going to face one of the worst recessions and the weakest recoveries of major economies this year. So again, also very bad. Long story short, I'm not going to try to anticipate what that's going to mean for the entire art market, but I think if we isolate it down to what's going to happen in those two countries, China and the UK, I think that I feel, I wouldn't say good enough, but confident enough that I can put that number of 5% year-over-year drop on it and feel like I've got a chance of coming out ahead. Do you think there's a chance that there's going to be a higher drop in either one of those economies when it comes to the art market? Sure. That's why I wrote it as at least 5% year over year. Yeah, it sounds like you have painted a pretty dire picture of the outlook in China and the UK. So moving on to your next prediction, which is one that you feel is a little bit risky? Okay, so I'm going to stay in the auction market. I'm also predicting that from January through June, meaning the first half of 2023, Total auction sales of works by ultra-contemporary artists, meaning artists born in 1975 or later, those sales will decline year over year for that period for the first time since 2019. Okay, so this is obviously a market that has been incredibly hot. This is the most speculated upon segment of the art market in terms of flippers, and I think that it's something that we've seen play out in headlines, that these art stars have been appearing overnight, essentially, all over the world that command extensive waiting lists, high-flying auction prices that come out of nowhere, it seems. So why do you think that the party is over when it comes to these younger artists? We were already starting to see some cracks in the market, especially in the latter half of last year. Don't get me wrong, there were still some of these young, extremely hot players who were doing well, going pretty far above their estimates at major sales, people under the age of 40 racking up million-dollar-plus results. But some of those same artists were also responsible for other lots that were coming in kind of within estimate or just frankly not setting the world on fire in the way that we had just become used to over the course of the preceding year, year plus. So when you combine that with what's happening in the economy, which I'm not going to belabor again here, I think that we're reaching a point where, frankly, the overall environment is just not conducive to people who have a lot of money to spend deciding that what they want to spend their money on in the art market is these, frankly, speculative assets that we're seeing coming from very young artists who have unproven markets, who are still building their careers and all that kind of thing. Are there any individual artists that you see as canaries in the coal mine in terms of underperforming uh, expectations at auction? Sure. So if we just look at what happened in the major New York evening sales in November, I can give you a couple of names. One is Anna Wayant. And although she had one result that went for over a million dollars, two of the three lots that were offered in those sales actually landed within her rumored primary price range of between $350,000 and $600,000. We can go even further than that if we look at, again, very in-demand names over the course of the past few years, Amawako Boafo, Nicholas Party, and Avery Singer, they all had works that were won on bids that were hammered below their low estimate. And in the case of Amy Sherald, again, hugely in demand over the course of the past several years, one of the two canvases of hers that showed up at Phillips Evening Sale didn't sell at all. So I'm by no means saying that these artists don't still have great careers ahead of them. But when it just comes to the particular hothouse that is the auction market, we're starting to see some loss of altitude when it comes to those extremely lofty prices. And this might be pushing the limits of your occult prediction ability, but what do you see 
this speculative money just decreasing in its participation in the market? Or would you see the speculative money potentially finding new avenues for speculation in different markets in the art world? I think that ultimately, we're just not in an environment that is particularly conducive to speculation as a whole. That's not to say that there won't be people who won't still take bets on things. But I think that the dollar values of those bets are going to be much lower than what they were. I mean, ultimately, this is a judgment on how excited people get and how high they're willing to go for things that are unproven. And right now, especially when we talk about the interest rate environment, high interest rate environments historically just basically rein in people's most profligate instincts. And all of a sudden, they go from being like, I will pay anything for this thing that I want right now, to maybe that's not such a good idea. Maybe I should think twice about this. And again, when we're talking about this particular section of the art market, that makes a tremendous difference. Well, I think the, the NFT market was kind of the cartoonish expression of this in the way that the spigot just shut off as the interest rates rose. But moving on to the next prediction, which one of your 2023 auguries do you hope is true? I'm going to go with this one, which is that AI image generators will become the subject of a class action lawsuit, <laughs> a formal inquiry by lawmakers, or both. So why do you think this is likely, and why do you want it to happen? Well, I should caveat this at first because, as sometimes happens when I go out with these predictions columns, I quickly got some feedback that maybe some of this isn't as likely as I thought. In this case, there are some very particular rules around like what qualifies as a class action lawsuit that I think it's probably going to be hard to get over in this particular case. So like that side of this prediction is already in trouble, but the inquiry by lawmakers part is to me, something that is pretty likely to happen. And if it's not actually going to happen, that doesn't mean that it shouldn't. I still feel very strongly that in general, especially in the US, tech companies have just been allowed to run wild for far too long. And Europe takes a very different stance on this in Europe these companies are largely just looked at as any other major business that is prone to bad behavior and probably needs to be reined in. But we've, even in the U.S., gone to a point where there is this thing called the tech lash. There is a real kind of populist anger against what big tech has done to the state of things, whether you're looking at the way the economy works, what's happened in elections, all these kinds of things. And so I think that we're just finally getting to a point where the people who are elected to office suddenly feel like they have, if not a mandate, at least some pressure that, hey, maybe these people that we've referred to or sort of thought of as these golden gods of Silicon Valley, maybe we need to take a harder look at them and try to get a handle on what it is that they're actually doing and whether or not they're acting badly enough that we need to come by with the ruler and kind of slap their knuckles. Okay, well, here's something uh, I think you might be uh, uniquely equipped to answer because you're quite an expert on the music industry as well as the art industry. Do you think that there is a parallel here between the way that the music industry protects artists from extensive sampling? There's a certain amount that you can sample, but then beyond that, you get into um, legal infringement. Well, it's an interesting comparison, but I think that this really starts to get us into some of the vagaries of copyright law when it comes to artificial intelligence and here in the art world when it comes to these text to image generators like Dolly or Midjourney or Stable Diffusion or what have you. So when it comes to US copyright law, the tricky part about this is that you can't copyright a style. So that's really what these image generators do. I could prompt one of these things right now to produce an image of Andrew Goldstein wearing a pair of original model Air Jordans and a three-piece Valentino suit in the style of Gustav Klimt. 
And it would give me something that would maybe it would need a little refinement, but in general would actually do a pretty good job of approximating a Gustav Klimt. But it's just an approximation. And an approximation is not something that you can take somebody to court over. So the issue here is that artists, if they were going to try to enforce this legally, would need to find some way to navigate around this problem that really what's happening is that their images are being used to train these things and then become a reference point for productions that are not themselves infringing on copyright. That's why I think that this is a tricky area to handle legally, I mean, based on the experts that I've talked to and other people I respect have talked to, but it still just kind of doesn't pass the smell test for most people. It still just kind of feels wrong. And when things feel wrong, that's enough for if we were to live in a country that had a functioning House of Representatives, say, they could actually just call some of these developers in and be like, look, we need to understand what's happening here because our constituents are not happy and you've got some explaining to do. Well, if I could just do one follow-up by quoting your column, you mentioned this one artist named Greg Rutkowski, who is a, a fantasy artist who you say the outputs from the AI image generators have been frequently mistaken for the original works. And that suggests to me that there is a sufficient amount of the DNA of this artist's work that's being fed into the generation of this particular image that you could say that that is where it's excessive. Right. And again, that speaks to exactly the tension here, because technically speaking, that's not a copyright violation. If you're just producing something that looks extremely like a Greg Rutkowski, that's fine in itself, unless you then go to the extent of saying, oh, this is actually Greg Rutkowski, and I'm going to try to sell it somewhere <laughs> or license it somewhere based on that. That's my understanding of the law. However, even given the explanation that I just gave a few seconds ago, your response was essentially, this just feels wrong. Like, this has to be a problem, and that's all that it would take for Congress or for legislators in the EU to be like, we don't like this, and we need to at least show that we're trying to do something about it. Moving on to the pentultimate prediction, which one of your predictions do you hope is going to be false? Well, just from a karmic standpoint, I don't like to predict that people who haven't really done anything wrong should fail. So from that standpoint, the prediction that I hope is false is that FIAC, the longtime homegrown Parisian art fair, will permanently shut down this year. So can you rehearse for the listeners the very sad and lamentable fate that FIAC has suffered the past two years? Sure, and I will plug our own podcast by saying that we have an entire episode about this <laughs> that aired last year. Shout out to Naomi Ray and Kate Brown, my illustrious colleagues here, for handling that episode. But in miniature, essentially what happened is that FIAC, which again is a fair that was founded in Paris, was the fair in Paris for many, many years and has long been held at the Grand Palais. All of a sudden, after the last edition in 2021, the Grand Palais came out and just said, so we're accepting proposals right now for a major art and culture event in this particular week at the end of October that has always been FIAX week. And RX France, which is the company that owns and operates FIAC, I think understandably kind of came out and was like, wait, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> like we essentially had a gentleman's agreement that we, I mean, we've been here for many years. 
we were planning on being here next year and for many years after that. Like, what exactly is going on here? And long story short, I believe that there are still some legal proceedings happening over that, but the Grand Palais was allowed to go ahead and solicit these proposals that came in. And we later found out that they chose to do this because they had got a competing offer from a rival of RX France and Fiat. And it was an unnamed rival at the time, so there was some speculation as to who exactly it might be. Fast forward, it turns out that it was Art Basel. And so it was announced in, I believe, the end of January of 2022 that Art Basel had won this open call for proposals, and Art Basel would roll out this fair that we now know as Paris Plus, which is now the new premier fair in Paris, and which we can talk about this more, but it was very well received in its first edition, and that's bad news for RX France and for FIAC going forward. And so FIAC now has been silent in the past year. They haven't had an edition. There's no clear plans for an edition this year, I believe. Has there been any stated plan? Not to my knowledge. I, as I often do when I make these predictions, especially in like the final minutes before I actually file them, it did some frantic searching to be like, oh my God, is there something I forgot about that is going to make one of these things immediately untrue? In this case, the answer seems to be no. I mean, RX France made a lot of noise when this open call for proposals was announced and as it proceeded, but in between about, I believe it was February 2022, when the company announced that it was not actually going to hire a director for FIAC, it was just going to give the task of managing FIAC over to the director of its other major fair, Paris Photo. Since then, we haven't really heard very much, and especially in the aftermath of this, again, very well-received, pretty successful first edition of Pari Plus, it's just kind of been radio silence, and when you combine that with everything else, it just doesn't feel like a very optimistic scenario for them. Your FIAC prediction is quite interesting in the context of some news that we just heard last Friday morning which is that MCH, Art Basel's parent group, is actually responsible for the snuffing out of a different fair, which happens to be specifically Masterpiece London. And it begs the question, do you think that your prediction of FIAC's demise in concert with Masterpiece London's demise might be a harbinger of sorts for a larger fair die-off this year, after there's been extensive build-out on the international circuit, we've seen a lot of fairs rising up. We've seen a lot of fairs rising up in Asia. We've seen a lot of fairs rising up all over the world. Do you think there's going to be a broader culling of these fairs in an adverse environment with all these economic headwinds that you mentioned? I certainly think it's possible. At the same time, I think that just we as humans have a tendency to jump to extremes when something like this happens. It's like, oh one of the mid-tier fairs disappeared. That means they're all going to go. And that's not usually what ends up happening. It tends to be something that you have to kind of calibrate a little more. So I think it's entirely possible that we'll see more than just Masterpiece London and potentially FIAC go down this year in that particular tranche of the art fairs. But what I'm 100% certain of is that this indicates that we are in for a year that is in a lot of ways going to be defined on the operational side of the art business overall by cost cutting. You're going to have people looking for ways to rein in their expenses left and right. And when it comes to fares, which to some extent are optional with an asterisk, like everybody does them, you kind of need to do some of them, but do you need to do all of them? That I think is a fair question. And just as we saw actually a few years ago, we kind of just went through a period like this where there was this real expansionist instinct on the fair front where you had major players like MCH Group investing in these mid-tier fairs. And then I think within a year or two, they unwound a lot of those same investments 
And so this is just kind of within a, a volatile field, meaning the art business overall. I think that the fair business in particular tends to be maybe even a little bit more volatile than some other sectors. So I think it's going to be a rocky year for sub premier tier art fairs in general, but how many of them are actually going to die off that I think we should probably be a little bit cautious about predicting. Hmm. Great answer. Okay. So final prediction, final question, which of your predictions for 2023 is your favorite? So I will go with this one, which is that one or more high-end galleries will build out a department specializing in licensing and branded merchandise. So this is a very fun prediction. Why do you think that's likely to happen? So if you look at the trend lines over the course of the past 10 to 15 years of the art business, to me, one of the real standouts has been this emergence and growth of licensing and branded merchandise. And I should clarify for people who don't necessarily speak this language that what this essentially means is taking the work of an artist and translating it over into some other business opportunity. One example that is very obvious is if you have, say, a major artist's estate connect with a fashion company of some sort to produce a line of merchandise, a line of clothing that directly uses images from the artist's body of work. This has become such a big opportunity over the years that we actually saw something that previously was almost unimaginable in the art world, which is that we now have really big name artists who have managed to create a name for themselves first in this sort of branded merchandise, streetwear kind of world that traditionally is not the art world. And they've been so successful there that they've been able to cross over into the kind of very stuffy art world. Cause is the ultimate example of this. Somebody who became a big name by creating vinyl toys, by doing artwork for Kanye West records, for creating special edition Air Jordans and whatever else. And now the guy is represented by Skarstedt and has been like making bronze sculptures and was just the subject of a major exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum. So we're just in a different environment overall. And I can keep going with this. Like every major gallery now basically runs the equivalent of a museum shop in their own gallery or as a standalone of some kind. You have major entertainment agencies like UTA, like Creative Artists Agency, like Endeavor, which by the way owns Freeze. Hiring and maintaining specialists who just work with visual artists on this kind of stuff. And when you put all that together, it just strikes me as being inevitable that at some point, galleries, especially major galleries, which have been so intent on turning themselves into these sorts of 360 degree art services companies, so you never have to go anywhere else to get your needs served if you're a major artist or if you're a major collector. I just can't see these businesses being like, yeah, you know what? It's okay. Major artists that we represent, go ahead and go talk to somebody else outside of our organization about how you want to license your artwork. That's fine. We'll just, you can take that business. You can decide how you're going to spend your time, all that kind of stuff. It just doesn't make any sense to me. I just have to believe that at some point those galleries are going to say, you know what? We're just going to build out that capability in-house, and then that's one more reason that you don't have to go looking elsewhere. And like, by the way, we also get to keep a bigger chunk of that money and sort of have more influence in how you're spending your time, major artist. And put it all together, I think it will happen this year. Okay, so I love this prediction. And I have two follow-up questions. One is that I think this is going to ring true with a lot of people because you just look around yourself in the pop culture, you see more art movies being made than ever, 
more artist fashion collaborations than ever. You see immersive art experiences popping up all over the place. We saw this whole spree of NFTs being used by museums as this additional like kind of digital poster to create a revenue stream. And it's really amazing. You see, it's just proliferating all over the world. And it suggests that there's a tremendous demand for this kind of lower cost entry into this art field. And I wonder, why is there? Do you believe that there actually is growing demand, that the demand for lower cost entry points into the art universe is actually growing at the pace that you would think that these ventures would suggest? It's tough to know exactly because this is just an area that we don't really have any solid data on, or at least very little solid data on, but it's also somewhat a follow the money and like follow the activity kind of question. And as you're saying, we just wouldn't be seeing this much activity of all these different types if there wasn't a pretty strong demand for it. The question I think is how much bigger is it actually going to get? And that's a very, very difficult thing to be able to identify. But what I will say is that one of the, to me, biggest but least talked about stories over the course of the past several years in the art business has been that if you look at the best estimates we have of sales totals, the art business has really kind of been stuck in neutral for close to a decade at this point. And if the people who are responsible for making art, for selling art, for exhibiting art, want to grow, I think that we've just reached a point where they're going to have to find these types of unusual, at least by historical standards, ways of trying to reach a larger audience. And a larger audience, frankly, means an audience that can't spend hundreds or even tens of thousands of dollars on unique or very limited edition artworks. That's where the types of branding and licensing opportunities come in. And again, I don't know where it's going to go, but I do think that it is a major area that these companies are going to be focusing on. So this is the second question that is going to require you to put your prediction hat on one last time, which is how big in terms of dollar value do you think that the market for derivative art products, like these ways to buy into the art universe that are lower cost, how big can that grow in comparison to the fine art market? Well, it's a hard question to answer in a super specific way. What I will say is this. So our colleague Katya Kazakina wrote a column last year about what we were referring to internally as Basquiat Inc., meaning the branding and licensing side of the Jean-Michel Basquiat estate, which has been among the leaders in branding and licensing in the art space. I will also say as a side note that Katya and I did an episode of this very podcast focused on that column. So since apparently I'm in a, just a rampant self-promotional mood today, go check that one out too. But within that column, Katya did have some data points. And one of them was this, which was that in 2019, art and design made up only 1% of the roughly $293 billion in global licensing sales, essentially. And that's according to Licensing International, which was a trade organization that obviously traffics in exactly this kind of data. Quantifying the size of the global art market is a very touchy subject in a lot of ways. I think it's very difficult to estimate it. The numbers that we tend to hear overall are somewhere between 60 and $70 billion. Again, I'm not like staking my own reputation on that, but if you compare the 1% of 293 billion dollars that the art licensing side of things makes up, that's essentially a little under $3 billion. So there's basically maybe at least a 20x multiple between art licensing now and global art sales now. So I'm not saying this is gonna change 
dramatically in the next year, but I think it's entirely reasonable, even if you're just saying, well, can the art licensing market double in size? I think absolutely it can double in size. Can it go 10x? Maybe so. Can it go higher than that? I think it's possible. Basically, what I would say is that it seems like right now we've sort of hit an upper limit, whatever number you want to put on it, on what global art sales are. But art licensing is really still just getting started and I think has a lot of runway ahead of it. Well, Tim, you did it again. You came up with a couple of riveting and totally credible prophecies for this year. And it's going to be interesting to see how these prophecies bear out. Thanks very much, Tim, for coming back on The Art Angle. Always a pleasure, Andrew. Well, that's it for this week's episode of The Art Angle. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, take a moment to rate and review us. It will help other listeners discover what we're doing. The Art Angle is produced by Sonia Manalili, Tim Schneider, and Caroline Goldstein. Thanks for listening, and see you next week. 